Okay, so there's a lot of important stuff that needs to be discussed. Um, we could have just had this as an informal discussion where I talk, you ask questions, you talk, I ask questions. Um, but today you miss stuff out, things get forget uh, forgotten, or you start discussing stuff that's going to come up later. So I thought I'll just make a few slides just to make this a bit more of a systematic discussion on the topic. Because the Quran and Sunnah and the sources of law, there is a lot to cover. There, there is a lot to cover. And those that are joining online, if you just keep your mics muted, uh, please. Unless obviously you need to ask a question. So everyone just make sure your mics are muted. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, why is this a very, why is this topic topic important? So, what we're going to be talking actually, firstly, is about the history of fiqh, how fiqh developed, how was fiqh in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, um, in the time of the Sahaba, why were there different opinions, why how was fiqh in the time of the Tabi'een, how did the formations of the school come about, when was the world, when did the world see, okay, this is Hanafi fiqh, and this is Shafi fiqh or Hanbali fiqh, when did this divide happen? And did this divide happen overnight that, you know, one person called Abu Hanifa came and he thought, you know what, let me start my own school. And then this happened. Or was it a continuation of the knowledge before him where he was just became one of the key figures in preserving that knowledge? So hence he was, so there's a lot of discussions and debates and things as Muslims we need to be aware of. And what, what's the problem not being aware of this stuff? Number one, what happens is you start having bad thoughts about imams. You know when imams they differ, like oh, well these imams at it again. He's differing. He's saying it's halal. He's saying it's haram. You know why can't they all just agree? So number one, and our low, our contemporary imams and jurists, and number two, the classical imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik. So I've had so many people say, oh, you know why did Imam Abu Hanifa, Malik, and Shafi have to come and ruin everything? You know before the world was so fine, following Quran and Hadith. So we have all these statements which stem from ignorance basically. So number one is to save us from bad thoughts of the Imams and your jurists. And what happens, another thing is, people start doubting Islam. That is Islam, if, if Islam is true, why is there so much contradiction? Why is one Imam saying this is halal, one saying haram? Didn't, you know, couldn't Allah just tell us what's halal and haram and end of? So then a lot of people actually start leaving Islam because of this, because they can't reconcile between the differences and they don't know why there's different opinions. And I get asked these questions all the time and all the time. So that's why I thought, okay, you know what, let me just do a talk on it. We'll record it. And so then whoever has any questions or misunderstanding, they just refer to um, this. Okay, so, th so that's that. So now the first thing is, okay, let's start. Okay, so what we're going to talk about so I hope these slides are good and um, I hope nothing missed out. But anyway, we'll see. So important terms. So first we're going to cover a few terms and we're going to cover what fiqh actually deals with, what fiqh means. The objectives of the sharia, in Arabic, maqasid al sharia, which is a plus and it's a big problem right now as well. The objectives of the sharia and I'll tell you why. We're going to cover the sources of fiqh and some discussions around it. I'll try to keep the... The, by the way, these discussions are not on a basic level. Some things will go way over your heads and you're like, I'm confused, I don't understand. Some things you'll take in. So the purpose of this course isn't just to, isn't to just like a dummy version of everything. I'm going to present some advanced things which will require a lot of hard work, a lot of thinking as well. And that's another purpose of this course, by the way, because, because you, know, you know, let's say us living in this country, we've all studied basics of biology, chemistry, and you know, the, when you study something, you realize how difficult it is, yeah? So now if I go to a GP or a surgeon, I'm not going to go into a surgeon and start giving my own opinion on how to do brain surgery. Because I know this is a very difficult topic and I'm not qualified, I'm going to stay silent, yeah? Only a fool would speak, you know, without qualifications. But because we haven't studied deen in Islam, we think it's a piece of cake. You know, you take this one sahih, this hadith is sahih, so I'm going to start voicing my opinions in front of jurists. Which again, it's very foolish because the reason why we do this is because we haven't studied Islam and the Sharia and we don't know how difficult and intricate it is to arrive at a, at a masala or at a ruling. So hence, we have a very simplistic understanding of what Islam actually is. So my, one of my pur purposes here is, is to, to show the people Islam is not easy. You know, to, to say this word, I think, you need to have studied for about 10, 15, 20 years on this, on this topic. 
And especially the illness today is everyone is entitled to their opinion, isn't it? Now, I'm entitled to my opinion. But unfortunately, when it comes to Islam, no, no one is entitled to an ignorant opinion. Because here we're not talking about what my opinion is, because we're talking about what the law of Allah is. So hence, only those people can talk about the law of Allah who literally have knowledge. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimullah, one of the students of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he wrote a book called A'lamul Muwaqi'een, which means the signs, or have you on translator, the signs of those people who write, sig who, who are the signatories, is that, is that the right English word? On behalf of Allah. Because what, you know when a mufti gives a fatwa, or when a person gives their own opinion, what are they actually doing? They are saying, according to the law of Allah, this is it, and I'm signing this off, that this is the law of Allah here, over here. So when sometimes it's very easy for us to say, I think this is, should be halal, or I think. In reality, what are we doing? We are, we are signing this fatwa on behalf of Allah. So that's, that's how we describe, that's the title of his book, when he starts talking about fatwas and giving opinions and things like that. So that's another reason. Is so we, w whenever something is presented to us, we have this hesitation. Should I actually be um, saying this? So one person came to Imam Malik rahimullah, from very far. I was supposed to read you some quotes. So can you just give me that book? That Usul Ifta, Wa'adabuhu. On top of Shami, the green one? Right on top. Yeah, yeah. Over there? Yeah, laying flat, yeah. So that one. Yeah, the Usul Ifta. The, on top of that. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So let's see if I can find it quick enough. Okay, so this is one of another reason why I've done this course is so that whenever a matter of deen is presented in front of us, the intelligent people are those who keep their tongue silent. Only when we have proper knowledge on the matter, then we start to speak. So if we, just some instance of the Sahaba. So let's say, you know, Sufna, Sufyan ibn Uyayna. He's not a Sahabi, he's a Tabi'i. He passed away? When? 198, yeah. He passed away 198. So he, used to, he would say, bil fatwa askutuhum fi. The most knowledgeable people in regards to giving their opinion is the, are those people who are most silent. And وَأَجْهَلُ النَّاسِ بِالْفَتْوَىٰ أَنْ تَقُهُمْ فِي The most ignorant of people in the matters of deen are those who are always talking, or who are, who are those who are always giving their opinions. So Imam Nawi, rahimahullah, he narrates from one of the tabi'in, he says, أَدْرَكْتُ عِشْرِينَ وَمِئَةً مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ الصَّحَابَةً This is one tabi'i, he says, I met 120 of the Ansar, Ansar of the Sahaba, which basically the elite of the Sahaba. And said, يُسْأَلُ أَحَدُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَسْأَلَةِ One of them is asked regarding an issue in deen. And he says, فَيُرُدُّهَا هَذَا إِلَى هَذَا He takes the question and says, now go to him. And they say, you go to him, he says, now go to him. He go to him, he says, now go to him. حَتَّى تُرْفَعُ إِلَى الْأَوَّلِ Until everyone passes on the question, until it goes back to the first person. Because the first person, in reality, he was the most knowledgeable guy. So everyone goes back to him at the end of the day. So that's how the Sahaba were. So some Sahabi, you know, They'd become angry when you ask them questions. And so let, I can't remember, I think it was Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar, I can't remember which Sahabi it was. So someone came to him and asked him a question. And he became angry. And he didn't respond until they walked away. And then he said to the people around him um, that, uh, so, and basically he said to the people around him that, do you know what these people want? They're asking me these difficult questions because they want me to make my back a bridge away from J Jahannam. Basically they want me to go to Jahannam, give them the answer. <laughs> So that even if it's wrong, they'll, you know, they'll, Allah, will, Allah will forgive them. So this is how the Sahaba were. So they would not, be, they would not hasten in giving their own opinions in regarding to deen. But anyway, so this is one of the other purposes of this course. Okay, so, so these are some of the things we'll discuss. I don't know how much of it we'll actually get through today, but inshallah we'll try our best. And we're gonna, I'm going to try and keep the not overload of information. Sometimes when you overload information, you end up going home with nothing. So I'm going to be repeating things quite a few times as well. Um, go, yeah. So next session I'll repeat some of the stuff that I said, or I'll expand on it a bit more today. You know, one day I might give you just the overall for you to digest, and then next lesson I'll expand a bit more and things like that. Okay, so some of the terms we need to understand. So fiqh, what does fiqh actually mean? The word fiqh actually just means to understand in classical Arabic. 
Like the Prophet said, the Prophet so recorded, said, La nafqahu kathira mimma or something like that. Yeah, we don't understand many things. So the fiqh literally means to understand. So if you look into, if you go into a dictionary, an Arabic dictionary, and, look, and you search up what the what the fiqh means, it just literally, literally means to understand. But later, as the science has developed, the science of jurisprudence, the science of Islamic law, was referred to as fiqh. And by the way, um, no one needs to write anything that's on these slides, so the slides can be handed out afterwards. So if you want to make notes, you can make notes of anything that's not on the slides. Just save the students from writing unnecessarily. Okay, so as the science has developed, fiqh, um, this word was given to science of jurisprudence because the jurists say the most important of all sciences is fiqh. Hadith is to pre preserve the hadith knowledge, you have all this, but fiqh is something that's practical every day. Every single person is in need of fiqh. How to pray salah, how to do wudu, the rights of the parents, the rights of the husband and wife, fiqh deals with all these sorts of things. So they say because the fiqh is the greatest of all sciences, obviously the hadith scholars would disagree, the tafsir scholars would disagree, but because according to the jurists, fiqh is the most important sciences, that's why this particular science was known, started to be known as fiqh at a later stage. Okay, so the term ijtihad. So what does the term ijtihad mean? These are things that we hear all the time. So this is, one transition of this is independent reasoning. To exert one's efforts to derive at a ruling in case in a case which permits ijtihad. Okay? By the way, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to talk uh, whenever, if, even from the online guys. I might not see the chat all the time. So, uh, Brother Jay, um is the screen being shared on Zoom? Uh, uh, yes, it is. I, I was. Uh, if okay. you shared the full screen, I think uh, it'd be easy to see. But maybe it's just my screen. So. Oh, okay. Um. Is this better? Uh, uh, that's better. Yes. Okay. Much better. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So. Ijtihad just literally means when a matter is unclear in the Quran hadith, a, a, a mujtahid, a person who is capable of doing ijtihad, he exercises all of his efforts, his human ability to arrive at a right conclusion. So this is what the term ijtihad refers to. And mujtahid is a person who has the qualifications to do ijtihad. So, and a muqallid is a person who does not have the qualifications to ijtihad. So hence a person who follows the rulings arrived at by a mujtahid is called a muqallid. So the Muslim Ummah is basically um, into two. You're either mujtahid in this, and if you're not a mujtahid, by default you're a muqallid. So a muqallid, because he does not possess the qualifications to give his own opinions, he cannot or she cannot say this is what I think or this is the right ruling because you're a follower of a mujtahid who is capable of doing that. Okay, so now what's a madhab? A madhab translates to a school of thought. We say these are Islamic schools. Well, what does it mean, a school of thought? Like, what is a school of thought? So what a school of thought is, these are opinions arrived at by mujtahid in matters which require ijtihad. Okay? So for example, if I say to you, alcohol is haram, do you need to follow my opinion on this? No, this is clear. So in matters which are clear, we do not follow a madhab. If someone says, so, yeah, so we don't follow a madhab in matters which are clear. Because you don't need to follow, we can go follow directly the Quran and hadith, it's easy here. So if I say zina is haram, you don't need to take my word for it. Everyone knows it. It's in the Quran. And these things are haram. If I said praying the salah is fard, you don't need to take my word for it. These are things are clear. So these are things where you, we do not follow madhab in. A madhab are those things which are unclear. So hence, if I said, if I said to you, for, let me give you a basic, basic thing. Eh? If I done my wudu in the wrong order, I wash my feet first and then my head and then my arms. Will my wudu will my wudu count? Okay. If you look into the Quran, you won't find this answer. If you look at the Hadith, you won't find this answer. If you look at the Sahaba, they didn't discuss this. Now, how would you know the answer? In matters which are unclear, now you need to follow the opinion of another, of a scholar who knows the principles of the Sharia and he's arrived at a conclusion. This is what you call a madhab. So, madhab are to do with those things which are unclear and they do not have an easy answer. Yeah? Come in. Okay. So, now what is the difference? Okay. Uh, that's the question. So, Mufti is a person who issues fatwa. So now a person who, is, who gives their own opinions after arriving at doing ijtihad is basically called a mufti. Yeah? And a mustafti is a person who asks, asks for a fatwa. So when you go to a scholar and you ask him a question, you're a mustafti. And a person that answers you, gives his opinion, he's a mufti. Yeah? And a fatwa is basically an answer to a question related to fiqh. 
And okay, so these are important. Any other important terms which I've left out? Anyone? And by the online guys, feel free to speak if you need to just unmute yourself and Okay. No? Okay, so before we move on, what is the most fundamental difference between secular law and Sharia law? Anyone? Secular law is from man. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically the difference. So when it comes to secular law, we can, if Boris Johnson comes out with a new rule tomorrow, I can say, you know what, I don't agree with that. No, that's wrong. If he did something better, because these are man-made laws based upon intellect, and intellect is deficient. So hence, man-made laws can be deficient because the source is, is deficient. Whereas a Sharia is not based upon intellect, it's based upon Allah. So there is no deficiency in the Sharia. So now if something is clear, this is halal, can or this is haram, can a human being with deficient intellect say, I don't agree with this, or well, I don't understand, or I think this is completely wrong? No, because the law, our intellect is too deficient, is deficient, hence a deficient source cannot object against something which is, you know, without limits. Yeah, so that's, that's the difference between sh uh, Sharia and um, secular law. That's why I move to the next slide. Oh, there. Okay, so now what is the realm of fiqh? What does fiqh deal with? So first we have ibadah. So fiqh doesn't just deal with salah and wudu, by the way, and how to read Quran. Yes, it's, so, uh, fiqh deals with ibadah. This is one aspect of fiqh. It deals with the worship. It also deals with buying and selling. So everything with anything related to buying and selling, it falls under the realm of fiqh. Whenever you're transferring property, it falls under the realm of fiqh. So if I'm giving you a gift, that falls under the realm of fiqh. How? When does, when does ownership transfer? That's the issue of fiqh. Um, let's, say if, let's say if I gift you my house. Yeah? When does ownership actually occur? Does it occur the moment I said, I've given you my house? Yeah? I'm not hinting to anyone. Yeah? <laughs> Yeah. So does the, does the ownership transfer as soon as I made the statement or does it transfer as soon as you've taken possession of it? Because the, the issues that would arise here is, let's say I've said the statement, now I think, you know what, I don't want to give it anymore. But when does ownership, so these are all to do with fig basically. Yeah. Renting, interest, mortgages, and all these sort of stuff, this is all the realm of fig. Family, how, to mar uh, how marriage is done, how divorce is done, rights of the, rights of the wife, rights of the husband, expenditure, inheritance. So these are all family laws, then we have social laws in the Islamic, um, so punishments, penalties, rights of others. Um, so I don't know, for example, let's say I have a wall and it's about to fall over and it's causing disturbance to people that are passing by. Can a local person uh, break my wall down? It's my property, but it's harming others. So this is all the realm of fiqh. And then if you have an Islamic state and government, there's specific laws on how to run the state, etc. So these are some, you know, basically everything falls under the realm of fiqh. That's why fiqh is known as the you know, the height of all knowledge. Okay. So now, after looking at what fiqh deals with, okay, so now what are the objectives of the sharia? So why, why does the sharia cover ibadat, family law, social law, state? What, what's the sharia trying to achieve? Anyone heard of the maqasid of sharia from here? Okay, so the maqasid of sharia. Mashallah. Okay, so what do I keep doing wrong? Oh, there we go. Okay, so the five maqasid of the Sharia. So number one is the protection of life. So what rules do we have in Sharia for the protection of life? Uh, Anti-abortion. Anti-abortion. What else? You can't kill. Yeah, you can't kill. But what happens if you do kill? Get hanged. Life for life. Yes, kiss yeah. us. Yeah. Protection of property. What laws do we have for the protection of property? In the in Islamic state, cutting off hands. Yeah, this is part of hudud. Yeah, protection of intellect. What do we have for that? Anyone? How, how does the sh Sharia aim to preserve intellect? What, what one law that's put in place for that? Just one law. Out of others, many others. Uh, if you just keep the mics muted, please. Okay. Yeah, so drugs. 
is haram. Alcohol is haram. Yeah, this is to preserve our intellect. Protection of religion, obviously, then we have all the ibadat and worships and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, protection of dignity. What laws are in place for that? Aura. Sorry? Aura. Okay, good. The laws of aura. Segregation. Segregation, okay, yeah, because that would lead to, yeah, other things. You can't backbite. Okay, good. You can't backbite, these all haram. And in Islamic state, we have Hadul Qadaf. If you slander a woman, let's say you accuse her of having relationships with another person, and she's found to be innocent of that, there's lashes. Yeah? So that's how serious slandering and dignity and honor of a believer is in Islam. Yeah? So many scholars, they reduce these, the ahkam to preserve these five things. That's why these five things are called the maqasid al sharia, the objectives of the sharia. Hamza, can you shut the door? Okay, but obviously these aren't um, completely, some add a sixth one, some add a seventh one, but generally all agree to these five things. But now there's something problematic with this. What do you think could be so problematic with the Maqasid of Sharia? What could be problematic? So these are a bit more in-depth discussions rather than just, you know, the usual rules and Masail. What could be problematic with the Masail of Sharia? Difference of interpretation. Okay, depends what you mean by that. By the way, online guys, feel free to unmute and speak as well if you want to. Yeah? Um, difference of interpretation. Okay, so I think what you mean by that, people can have um, different understanding of what the maqasid are, so they're not. Okay. That's exactly like one, one hand could be interpreted differently by different school of thoughts. That's why I meant. Okay, good. Probably society has now. Well, like. They like to think they progressed, but some of these things have become very complex. Mm. Um, so it's not now, a lot of things are not very straightforward. It requires a lot of um, knowledge and skill trying to understand some of the, um, you know, some of the things that we're trying to protect now. That, yeah. Mm. yeah, true. And I see you checking the, keep an eye on that, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the first thing is, okay, the Sharia law, is obviously it's not man-made, yeah? It's from Allah and there's no disputes, no doubts, yeah? There's no room for intellect in that. But is this, did Allah reveal that these are the maqas objectives of the Sharia? Or did the Prophet say these are all the objectives of the Sharia? Or did we speculate this from human reasoning and we did we infer this, yeah? So the problem is we actually inferred this. The Prophet did not say these are the these are the objectives I'll come with. Or the Quran doesn't say these are the objectives of the, of the Sharia. This is human speculation. So going through all the Quran verses of the Hadith, the jurists have sat down and said, you know what, it seems like the Islam or the Sharia is trying to preserve these things. Does that make sense? So because this is human reasoning, it can have faults. Yeah. So now can you use this to oppose an established verse of the Quran? No. Can you use this to oppose established authentic narrations of the Prophet no. no, you can't. Because that, the source of that is divine and the source of this is human intellect, which has deficiencies. So the problem is the many modernist, modernist scholars, they say, okay, you know what? This is the maqaz of the sharia. So now we, because now times are different, times are changed and things like that. So then we, they use this to go against the actual Quran and Hadith. A lot, and this is like a trend that's happening now. Like the, these are maqasid sharia. We're in new times, so hence we need to use the maqasid and get rid of old stuff. Does that make sense? So they say, um, yeah, so this has become a big problem. That's why I said there's good in this. So why is there good in this? In many things that the Quran and Hadith is not so clear. Yeah? So there's, there's no verse of the Quran regarding an issue, and there's no Hadith regarding an issue. So what do you do now? So one thing that you can resort to after many other things is you can say, okay, let's, what fits more in line with the maqasir sharia? Should we make this halal or haram? You know, is it, is it, does it contribute towards protection of life, property, intellect, religion, whatever? Yeah? So that's where you can, these things come in handy. Okay. okay. Keep forgetting which ones are. Oh, there's the buttons. Okay, so now what are the sources? Uh, okay, the sources of fiqh. So obviously the ulama and those that are learned will obviously know the sources of fiqh. So we're going to have a discussion related to the sources of fiqh. Okay, so who knows the sources of fiqh? Where does fiqh come from? Quran and Sunnah. First one is Quran. Yeah. Second source of fiqh is the Sunnah. 
which is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu Any other sources of fiqh? Uh, yeah, the sahaba, the righteous people. Sahaba, okay. That's an interesting discussion. If let's say Sahabi said something, is that binding upon us just like the Quran? Uh, no, it wouldn't. But if the if the Quran and Sunnah is silent on a the matter, then perhaps you could you could uh, refer to uh, prominent, eminent Sahaba. Okay, okay. So if the Quran and Sunnah is silent, you can refer to the Sahaba. What if the Prophet said one thing and the, and the Sahabi is saying complete opposite? Then the Prophet is uh, he overrides. Okay. Yeah, these are what we call usuli discussions. Yeah, according to Imam Shafi, he would most likely say, no, I'm going to go with the Sahabi. Either Imam Shafi or Imam Malik, I can't remember. He would say, I'm going to go with the Sahabi. I'm going to leave the hadith to a side, and I'm going to take the Sahabi's hadith over. Yeah, because the difficulty is just going to the Prophet mm. is that we, don't, we may not understand the context in mm. what he's saying, whereas yes. the Sahaba, they would have understood the context, yeah. um, and therefore they would have practiced according to the con context of, mm. of the hadith. Yeah. yeah. So some, some would agree to that, but other Imams would disagree. So they would rather go to the Hadith because the Sahabi could have made a mistake in his understanding, isn't it? Sahaba are still humans like us and they could have misinterpreted, misunderstood it. So these are what we call usuli differences. And there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of discussion regarding the Quran being a, as a source of proof and the Sunnah being a source of proof. But anyway, we're going to touch upon these discussions. Not so that you become experts in usul and principles, just so you understand the intricacies where of these it's not just you know so you know sometimes you hear in the streets you know i follow quran and sunnah <laughs> this is the most emptiest statement you know <laughs> there is yeah especially from a person that doesn't even know arabic yeah <laughs> but anyway so what are the sources of fiqh yeah, but obviously as muslims we all follow the quran so now that's obviously we can't deny that it's just a person who's not knowledgeable who claims that it's very thingy but anyway so these are the sources of fiqh the Quran, the Sunnah, Ijma, and Qiyas. Qiyas is analogy. So the Quran, obviously, we know what that is. And the Sunnah are uh, the hadith of the Prophet. What's the hadith? A statement of the Prophet, an action of the Prophet, and his taqrir, which is when something would happen in front of him and he would stay silent. This is also a hadith. So a companion would come and say, I done this. Okay, so then we have okay, then we have ijma, which is consensus, and there's a lot of dis debate discussion. We'll go into that. So this is when all the much, all the scholars in an era agree upon something. Do you think this is possible today? Yeah. Okay, so then we have qiyas, which is analogy. So let's say the Quran says that alcohol is haram, yeah, but there's it's silence on cannabis. So how do you get the how do you get the ruling of cannabis? You use qiyas. So you say the reason why alcohol is haram because it intoxicates the mind. Is the same property found in something else? We'll say yes. So hence we extend the ruling from a known source, from a known case, uh, to a new scenario. That's how qiyas works. And there's discussions on qiyas as well. Imam Dawood al Zahiri, one of the earliest scholars, he said um, qiyas is tagut. Tagut is how do you translate that? I idol falsehood. Oh, falsehood. Yeah, so the, you have the Zahiri Madhab who is completely opposed to Qiyas because this is no such thing. Because how, the source of Sharia is divine and the Aqal is human. So how can you use that as a source of Sharia? This is a falsehood or a devil. Yeah, but anyway. An interesting question now. What is the role of human intellect? So is my human intellect a source of Sharia? Yeah? No. So when a human says, I think in front of the Quran and the Hadith, do we really care what he thinks or she thinks? No, we don't. Because your thinking is not divine. Yeah? We want to know what the Quran of Allah is, not what a human being thinks. Yeah? But what role is, what role does the intellect have? Number one, the role of analyze you need for to use qiyas, you need intellect, isn't it? Yeah? So that's one role aql has. In Arabic we call this aql, intellect. Yeah? Because to find a common property in a new case, you need intelligence for that, intellect for that. That's one role of the aql. Yeah? Another one is to understand the maqasid of sharia. Yeah, so the, we know when I said when there's no Quran and hadith specifically regarding new cases, so hence you need intellect to arrive at the maqasid of sharia. Uh, um, what, what's the maqasid of sharia? Uh, goals of the sharia. What did I translate as before? Purposes of the sharia. 
and then you arrive at ruling. So yes, for certain things, intellect is required. Yeah? And you also need intellect to derive ruling from the Quran and Hadith. Yeah? This is the realm of intellect. Yeah? Nothing else. Okay, so now let's go into these. Let's see what we're going to talk about. Before I begin, yeah. um, I would challenge that. Um, yes. Ultimately, isn't the Quran, the Quran that we have today, isn't yeah. that based on human intellect? Because it's been recorded by humans and passed down from humans. Mm. Isn't the Sunnah that's been recorded mm. human intellect? There were Imam, Imam Bukhari came many, many hundred years later and he applied his intellect to derive the Sunnah. So ultimately, isn't this all... Um, the work of man. Mm. Um, so, a, is the question is the preservation of this based on intellect? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, yes, definitely. Um, but that, yeah. So my point here was that intellect is not a source of Sharia. Yeah. So obviously, to preserve the Quran, to preserve these, then yes, intellect will be required. But that's not the, really the source. The source is the Quran, isn't it? The source is the sunnah, the words of the sunnah. But yes, to preserve them, you need work of man and intellect needs to go into it. But when it, when it comes to understanding what the sharia is, or deriving rules from the sharia, intellect, um, we cannot say, this is halal based on my intellect. This is haram based on my intellect. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, so intellect is not a source of sharia. Yeah? Okay. No, no, my point was, look, Allah didn't just drop the Quran in printed form to us, right? Mm. It was... Um, there, there, there could possibly be mistakes in how it was trans how it was uh, written down, how it was recorded, and those mistakes could have carried over. Mm. Um, I'm just saying in theory, mm. yeah. because it, people forget. I'm yeah. saying also um, these imams that came along, like Imam Bukhari or what have you, mm. they could have missed certain hadith. Right? Mm. So there yeah. could be parts of the Sharia missing that yeah. we are not aware of. Okay, um, interesting. Yeah, so these sort of things, these differences, and these, we're going to come to that, yeah. So, so I'm just, so the point of this here is just so whatever is purely from Allah, that is our law, yeah. So human has no um, opinion. opinion in that, yeah. So when it comes to preservation, how, how was the hadith recorded, did the Sahabi make mistakes, things like that, these are subsidiary issues, we're going to come to them afterwards, yeah. So I'm just trying to say here, the source of law is, the shari is divine only. Yeah. So as a human, my intellect is not a source of law. That's all I'm trying to say at this point. Yeah. So I'm going to come to your discussions. Okay. So discussion the source of Sharia. So the first thing that the scholars debate about when it comes to the Quran is how many verses are actually related to fiqh, to rulings. Some say it's 300, some say it's up to 500. So basically a small portion of the Quran, how, how many verses, yeah, is related to ahkam and rulings. Okay. That's the first thing. And some things, rulings, uh, some rulings are definitive and some rulings are speculative. I'm going, to explain, I'm going to go into that. So just bear with me for now. I'm going to explain what it means by definitive, speculative, etc. Okay, so that's the Quran. There's not much, too much debate about the Quran. Um, although there is... Uh, let's see what if I discuss this. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll come to it anyway. So ruling, some rulings can be definitive or speculative. What do I mean by that? Okay, so this is extremely important that we understand this, extremely important. Okay, so first is definitive means it's absolutely clear there is no room for disagreement, yeah? It's absolutely clear there's no room for disagreement. So in, when it comes to some issues, the foundation is definitive, meaning the source that we get this from it's absolutely clear that it's, it's either from Allah or it's from the Prophet. So I'm giving an example. What's from Allah or from the Prophet? That's absolutely clear. Yeah, the Quran. Yeah. So if you take a verse of the Quran and use this as your proof, is the source definitive? Yeah. yeah? Or if, if it's 100% absolutely established that the Prophet said this, then the source is again definitive. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So sometimes the source is definitive. And what it indicates to what is also definitive. For example, Allah says in the Quran, Aqimus Salah. Establish salah. Is it authentic source? Yes. Is the fact that salah is fard um, clear? Mm -hmm. Yes. Allah, this is a direct command in so many places in the Quran. Establish salah. Establish salah. Yes, it's fard. So the foundation is definitive. Indication is definitive. Can a Muslim now uh, reinterpret this to mean something else? No. no this, is, this is my misguidance. So in, when the foundation is definitive, indication is also definitive, there's no room for difference of opinions. Yeah? We are silent on this. 
Okay, sometimes the foundation is definitive. Yeah? So let's say it's from the Quran or authentic hadith. But the indication is speculative. It can mean this, someone can, or it can mean something else as well. For example, let's say, I'll take a basic example. Allah says in the verse of wudu, wipe over your heads. Does Allah say how much of the head? The full head, quarter of the head, one hand. Let's say Allah said wipe over your head. If I just took my finger, wet it on the top and just on the, on the back. Have I wiped over my head? Have I done it? Yes. Yeah. But this is what you call a mujmal verse. Where it's unclear how much of the head am I supposed to wipe. Yeah. So there can be room for different opinions. Yeah. So the indi although the foundation is definitive, but the indication is speculative. Does that make sense? So here there can be more than one uh, meaning. And then you have where the foundations are speculative. Let's say the ruling is from hadith and there's two opposing hadiths, apparent opposing hadiths, or the hadith isn't as authentic. Yeah? So right from the foundation is speculative, even though it may be, in its indication, it may be definitive. Yeah? For example, um, there's one hadith that the Prophet said, Al-Witru haqqun ala kulli muslim, or Al-Witru wajib ala kulli muslim. Witr is the right of every believer or wajib upon every believer. Yeah? So we say this is obligatory, witr salah. The Hanafis take this. But let's say there's other hadiths that seem to indicate that witr is not obligatory. Yeah? So although this hadith is... Um, but the, from a authentic perspective, this could be speculative. So another imam can... Although this hadith is clearly saying witr is wajib, but another imam can come and say, I don't agree with its foundation. I see, I see some weakness in this chain of narration, for example. Does that make sense? So hence, there can be differences of opinion in rulings that our foundations are speculative. Even if it's the indication of what the Prophet is saying is definitive. Does that make sense, everyone? Mm. Yeah? And obviously, then the last one is when the foundation is speculative, uh, the authenticity isn't agreed upon. And likewise, the, what the Prophet is saying can, can be interpreted in two different ways as well. Yeah? So only the first... So look, only in the first type where we don't, there are no differences of opinion. In all the rest of the other types, there is room for difference of opinions. Yeah? Okay. And there's many other discussions regarding the Quran. So what happens when, let's say if a sunnah opposes the Quran, if a hadith opposes the Quran, what do you do? Do you go with the Quran? Do you go with the hadith? Do you say, I don't know, and just sit there? So these things happen. Sometimes a Quran opposes the verse. Of, uh, sorry, the Hadith opposes the verse of the Quran. Classically, there's a debate: Can Hadith abrogate the Quran or not? So the Quran says it's halal. Can the Hadith come and say can make it haram? Yeah. So what's the hierarchy? Is the Quran the first hierarchy? Hadith is the second hierarchy. Are they both in the same level? So these are all debates that the classical ulama um, had. This is what we call usul al fiqh. Yeah. So fiqh, some, you know, sometimes we deduce fiqh to saying a sahih hadith in Bukhari and say, you know, this is my fiqh. But, you know, we're missing thousands of years of scholarship on usul and principles of fiqh. You know, the first person to actually write a book on usul al-fiqh, on the principles of fiqh was, anyone know? Anyone? From the online guys? Okay, so the first person to actually write a book on this was Imam Shafi'i. Although Usul al-Fiqh was known beforehand, but basically someone asked Imam Shafi that can you write me a like a, a, a manual so I can refer to it and you know people are getting confused with this. So he, he wrote the principles of Usul al-Fiqh according to the, sun, um, the people of Sunnah. So Imam Shafi was the first person. But anyway, so these are all debates that happened. Is there, is there an example where um, the Hadith would differ to what's written in the Qur'an? Um, from the top of my head? I can't think of it. There are many examples, but I can't think of it from the top of my head. I'll, I'll double check and I'll go back to you. Can you see anything? Yeah, but there are. I've come across a few cases. Um, are they on like big matters or is it like really small issues? Even, even big matters. Um, yeah, because what happens is and this was another, because um, these are all debated issues. Yeah, okay, let's say, let's say okay, um, one verse Allah says in the Quran is to do with inheritance. Allah says, when you, when you pass away, then bequest for your inheritors. Yeah, so this is a command from Allah. When you pass away, be, um, so, you know, give something to your parents and whatever, yeah? 
And then there's a hadith that says La wasiyata li warith. There is no bequesting for an inheritor. So on one hand, the Quran is saying bequest for your inheritors. And on the, in the hadith, the Prophet is saying there is no bequest for an inheritor because the sharia has already allocated parents will get this percentage, mother will get this percentage, wife will get this, children will get this. Yeah? So now there's a contradiction here. Which one do you follow? There's another one, obviously the classical yeah. one. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's the where, where the debate be there? Hmm? Where's the debate there? Well, it seems to sort of the Prophet mm. said, you know, you know, he's instructing for a certain individual or group to be killed, which oh, okay. sort of goes against oh, okay. the, the, the Quranic that you know that, that, that there'd be no compulsion and no one should kill. Oh okay, yes, 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 definitely yes. Yeah. And I'll, I'll touch upon that as well, because that was an issue in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu where Abu Bakr when he became the Khalifa actually fought those people who refused to pay zakat and this was the ikhtilaf that occurred between Umar and Abu Bakr Abu Bakr said this is the right thing, I need to fight them whoever refused to give zakat, I will fight them and Umar said, no you can't fight them the Prophet said, you know, if they are believers we cannot fight them yeah, so there's a difference and but we'll get into that another time Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so basically, there are many differences of opinion in the Sharia. We're going to come to, by the way, I'm going to touch upon why the different opinions and all these, this is all coming. I'm just trying to have some foundational discussion around the Quran. So I'm just trying to show you it's, these things aren't so simple. Okay, so a question. Did the legislator, which is, who's the legislator? Allah. Allah. Intentionally leave room for differences or was this accidental? Alim Salam. Um, so, uh, um, your mic is very unclear and I can't understand anything. Um, your mic is very unclear and I can't really understand anything. Um, so I think your connection is quite bad. Uh, sorry, I can't understand anything. As you said, Imam, um, oh, it has to do with the hadiyah given by the late the one. Chat, you can just read it. If you just put the question, uh, if you just it, put it, the it, question it, in the chat, then I'll read it because um, your connection is quite unstable, so I can't understand the question. Okay. It's, it's... Okay. If you just put it in the chat, then I'll, I'll come back to that, inshallah. Okay. So, did the legislator intentionally re re leave room for differences, or was this accidental? Okay. So. Yeah? So the fact that the legislator made certain ahkam rulings in Islam where there's no debate at all. Praying five times slides far. Zakat is far upon the wealthy. These are the rights of hajj. These are far. No one can disagree. So there are certain ahkam that Allah has made. There is no room for differences of opinion. Yeah? The fact that Allah made some rulings definitive, that indicates was the possibility Allah could have made other rulings definitive, isn't it? Does that make sense? But the fact that Allah didn't shows that this was intentional. Because Allah could have just made, these are all the rules and these are obligations, these are the um, desirable things. Allah could have, yeah? But He didn't, which shows this intentionally left room for open to interpretation. So you're going to say something? Mm -hmm. Oh no. no. Yeah? So that's the first thing about, we, this is a very important point, yeah? So, and this is a mercy for the, uh, this is mercy from the Prophet ﷺ and from Allah. Because imagine if Allah, if, imagine if Allah said all the obligations in one go, these are obligations, these are obligations, these are obligations. What would that mean? It, what, what that would mean is since there's no room for interpretation, we all have to stick to one understanding of the Sharia. Times change. Situations become difficult. Imagine if we had, had the same law since 1,400 years ago and it had to apply uh, today without any flexibility. Yeah. So the f yeah. Go. Okay. Yeah. So the fact that we have flexibility. Let's say um, there's an unclear matter. So four imams or five imams they do the ijtihad and all arrive at five different rulings. Yeah. I'm going to follow my imam because I'm trusting the most. But let's say there's a time comes where to follow his opinion becomes absolutely difficult. Then what a mufti can do say you know what this is also this opinion also exists from this imam. So we can, you can follow this opinion. So this is why. There, some matters were made speculative so that to give us flexibility and room for different opinions to make things easier for the Ummah. Yeah, so that, that's the point of this. Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, so the other thing I was going to say is, is, is if, if you look at 
the, the consequence of human society, mm. if everything was made clear and there was no room for discussion, for example, you know, then there'd be no reason for us to sit here today to, to discuss. So human society would really, I mean, human society would not come together and, mm. and we would end up stagnating and, and the, you know, the, no cultures or no civilizations would, would develop as mm. if everything was black and, black and white, for example. Yes, of course, yeah, that's another point as well. Inshallah. Okay, so this is a very important point that we need to understand, and many people unfortunately don't understand this, and it's like getting confusion about Deen and why is there some different opinions and things like that. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Okay, so we've gone through, and in the Sunnah, there's so many debates, those categorizations of Sunnah. There's authentic sunnah, there's, weak, there's authentic hadiths, weak hadith, there's hasan hadiths, um, there's mursal hadiths. Mursal hadith is, let's say, a tabi'i who never saw the Prophet. He says, the Prophet said this. He never saw the Prophet. Do you accept a mursal hadith or not? Yeah? Imam Abu Hanifa, according to Hanifi Fiqh, you accept mursal hadith, generally. Yeah? Imam Ahmed al Hanbal, he was very reluctant to accept a mursal hadith. Like, he never saw the Prophet, how can I accept his statement from the Prophet? Yeah, so there's differences in the soul as well. You know, sometimes you know this uh, the statement may be authentic, but some imams, according to the principle, accept mursal hadith. Yeah, and some imams they don't accept mursal hadith. Okay, so then you have qiyas. So like I mentioned, what qiyas was to extend a known ruling to a new scenario due to a common illa, which is the common principle. The zahiri, a dawud al zahiri, he called it. He called this talbot. So he didn't agree to qiyas. He said, you know, how can Qiyas, which is human intellect, be a source of sharia. So he didn't agree to it. So basically, you can't be a jurist without using your intellect, yeah? So obviously he, he was a jurist. Basically, they done similar stuff, but he just like went around in a different way and they called it something else. Did Qiyas exist in time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Yes, it did. Yeah, so even the Prophet did Qiyas. The Prophet, whenever... Um, a ruling was not known, he would, the Prophet would do Qiyas and he would try and arrive at the judgment. If he was right, Allah would leave him to it. If he was wrong, Allah would tell him, reprimand him, that no, this is wrong, this is the correct thing. Sahaba did Qiyas as well. Um, yeah. But anyway, we're going to come to a lot of these differences in the Hadith and Quran. I'm just trying to go through. Okay. So, what to do when there are apparent contradictions between Quran and Sunnah? This is a subject in itself. Um, some rulings were abrogated, so not all verses of the Quran are there to be acted upon, some were abrogated. So one was a, let's say in al regarding alcohol, Allah says, um, Rizqan Hasana. Allah says, alcohol, no, there's goodness in it for you. So you're going to read that verse of the Quran and start drinking alcohol because there's goodness. No, there's, this verse is abrogated. Even in hadith as well, the Prophet sometimes said something. Later on, he abrogated his initial ruling. So someone that says, you know what, I'm just going to follow Quran and hadith myself. How do you, you know, are you following an abrogated ruling and an abrogator? So these, all these issues exist. Um, so basically, yeah, so these are the sources of the Sharia. And so I forgot Ijma. So Ijma, by the way, there's two types as well, definitive and speculative. So there's loads of debates when it comes to Ijma as well. So in Ijma, it's basically when everyone agrees to something, which is very difficult. So for example, how many rakats do you pray in Dhuhr Salah? Five times Salah as well. In the basic Masail, basically, there are... Um, ijma. So, but there's different opinions. So Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who, where the Hanbali fit comes from, he said it's impossible to have Ijma after the Sahaba. So he said, you know, this doesn't really exist. By theory, yes, but this doesn't, after Sahaba, this doesn't exist. Um, Imam Shafi, he was again hesitant to say that, you know, there is Ijma. So he would say, I don't know any Ijma in this all the time. Um, Imam Malik, he was a proponent of the ijma of the people of Medina. He said, if the people of Medina are unanimous upon something, this is the rule. Yeah? This is binding upon us. So the difference understanding of ijma as well. And also then you have a sunnah for ijma as well, which makes it speculative or definitive. What if I told you that the Sahaba were unanimous upon this ruling? But what's my source? Is it a strong source? Is it credible? The people that I got it from is it credible? So hence, if they're all strong narrators telling me that Sahaba de Jima, this would be definitive, isn't it? Yeah? But what if there's a weak people in between? Yeah? So even Ijma can be speculative. Okay, but anyway. So let's move on. 
Okay, let me give you some example of apparent contradiction between. We're not going to go in for too long. So I'm just going to finish the Quran and Sunnah stuff off. And then next lesson, we'll go into a bit more. Okay, so famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. I believe this was after the Battle of Ahzab, wasn't it? In the sixth year after Hijrah. So the Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba, لا يُصَلِّيَنَّ أَحَدُكُمُ الْعَصْرِ إِلَّا فِي بَنِي قُرَيْضَ That none of you should pray your Asr Salah except in Banu Qurayza. So this is a specific command. Where should they pray the Asr? In Banu Qurayza. Yeah? And the Prophet ﷺ, by the way, is a legislator. He himself is a legislator. Why? Because Allah commands us in the Quran, يَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهِ O you who believe, obey Allah وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولِ And obey the Messenger. So the Prophet ﷺ, he has his own authority to legislate. Yeah? So he's a legislator. So as a legislator, he is t gave them a specific command, you must pray your Asr Salah in Banu Qurayza. Banu Qurayza was a Jewish tribe. Yeah? So the Sahaba, they understood to be far. On the way, while they were going to Banu Qurayza, it was Asr time. And if they waited to get to Banu Qurayza, Asr time would have finished and Maghrib would have started. Now there's a problem. What's going to be the problem? Anyone? What, what, what's the question here now? So you're going to miss, do you strictly follow the letter of the Prophet or mm -hmm. do you um, apply the general principle that you pray Salah to? Yeah, that's, that's the issue here. So because we have so many other hadith, the, the best deed is Salah at its prescribed time, the verse of the Quran, Salah has its own prescribed time, etc. So on the one hand, you have all these evidences that you must pray your Salah at your uh, prescribed times. Another, another side, we have a hadith saying you have to pray Asr Salah later, okay? Now, is this definitive? So now, the question is, should we pray Asr Salah in Banu or should we pray it now? Is this a definitive issue, where there's only going to be one opinion? No, this is speculative. Now, because on one side we have evidences to pray Asr Salah now, on time, yeah? On the other side we have this one hadith, which seems to specify these rulings. The general ruling is this, you should pray on time, but now for this particular situation we have a new ruling, which is qualifying the previous evidence. Does that make sense? So that's why some Sahaba, they said, we're going to pray Asr Salah in Banu Qurayza. Because this new command is specifying the old command. Yeah? For us, right now. So they prayed Asr, they made the Salah Qadha and they performed in Banu Qurayza. Other, um, other companions thought, no, the Prophet just encouraged us to go there early. Not to literally pray there. So they took the illa, the common, the principle, underlying principle, and they acted upon that. Yeah? So they didn't follow the letter of the law, they followed the common illa, the, the principle. Okay, so that, that's fine. So one group of companions prayed there, another group of companions prayed later. Yeah, so, but the thing is, when they came to the Prophet what do you think the Prophet said? Who did he tell off? Which group? Neither. Neither. Which showed his approval of both parties. So the Prophet actually encouraged Ijtihad. Both the groups were right and both the Asr Salahs were correct. Because whenever the Prophet is demonstrating, whenever there's room for different opinions, different opinions are fine. That's why there's another hadith that the Prophet said that um, he, he told one companion, when a hakim, when a judge, he, in, a, in, in an unclear issue, when there's no Quran and hadith, when he, makes a, when he tries to do ijtihad to arrive at the ruling and he makes a mistake, he still gets one reward. And if, he, if he's correct, he gets two rewards. So meaning if someone, a muqallid, was to follow even a mistake of a mujtahid scholar, the mujtahid scholar, as long as he's done his best to arrive at the right conclusion, even if he's wrong, he'll be re rewarded. And the fact that the mujtahid scholar is rewarded, that means the followers, will they be sinful for following his opinion? No. Yeah. But this is when a mujtahid scholar gives his opinion. But when a non-mujtahid scholar person, who doesn't have any qualifications, yeah, Let's say someone, you know, he just finished learning his Alif Ba'atatha and he starts giving his opinions on fiqh and he's wrong. Would he be sinful? Yes, because he's not qualified. And whoever follows him, they'll also be sinful because they're following an unqualified person. Okay? So basically, in Hadith and Quran, you do, have, you do see some contradictions that... Not, uh, not, they're not in reality, but they're not contradictions. There is no contradiction in Quran and Hadith. It's just the way we understand... Because we haven't understood what was meant by that, that's why to us it seems like a contradiction. But in reality, from the perspective of the legislator, there is no contradiction. So, for example, there's a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, when he done wudu, he sprinkled water on his feet. Does his, is his wudu valid? Yeah? So, no, the contradiction here would be, when I do wudu, can I just sprinkle water on my feet? The Quran tells me to wash my feet, but the action of the Prophet ﷺ, he just sprinkled wudu, water on his feet. 
there's an apparent contradiction. Is washing the entire foot fard, like the Quran says, or can I just sprinkle water over my feet and my wudu be valid, like this hadith? It's an authentic hadith. Can I follow this on the authentic hadith? See, these issues arise basically. Yeah? Anyone know, so anyone know the basic answer to resolve this issue? Since he waterproof sucks. Right? No. He, he, he just his feet, bare feet. Oh. Anyone know a, a basic reason to resolve this issue? What did the Prophet not, he did not to do with her? Or is it with the other cat? Yeah, that's one, that's one um, possibility. He already had wudu. Yeah? So sometimes the Prophet um, would actually do quick wudu. So let's say he would just wash his face, arms and hair and he wouldn't wash his feet. And he would say this is the wudu in another narration, not the same narration. He would say this is the wudu of a person who already has wudu. Because you might have taken your sh shoes off, socks off. You know, it, it's difficult and he doesn't need to because he already got wudu. Yeah? But if you didn't know that, if you, I'm just this is a very, very simple case. This applies to bigger things as well. So if you didn't know that, you don't know the background behind things and the principles, you're going to make a lot of mistakes in fiqh. Um, yeah, so... So, okay, so one conversation. I'll just show you, like, Imam Abu Hanifa, he was obviously, you know, he was a great Imam. I was, imam Abu Zari was his contemporary. And he was genuinely from Sham. So I'm going to finish in a couple of things, yeah? So Imam, when are we supposed to finish, by the way? Okay. So Imam Awzai, he was a contemporary of Imam Hanifa. So the debate, they had a debate basically. So Imam Awzai, and he was knowledgeable on the same level as Imam Hanifa, by the way. So he was, his knowledge was, he was a Mujtahid Imam, and he could, he, he can easily have his own madhab. Yeah, we'll, under we'll understand why he doesn't and things like that afterwards. But he was basically another Mushtad Imam. So they were debating about should you do your Rafa al-Yadayn before you go into Ruku? Nowadays, there's a big issue, isn't it? So you see someone in our masjid like raising their hands like, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, is he Muslim or not? <laughs> yeah, so, but anyway, so they were discussing about um, should you raise your hands before going to Ruku and before, after coming up from Ruku? Yeah, so Imam Hanifa says there's nothing properly established on this. So you don't raise your hands. And I was, Imam al says, well, what about the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar? You know, he, he raised his hands. And he, he said that the Prophet would raise his hands. Yeah? And Imam Hanifa, yeah? And Imam Hanifa, he countered that, said, okay, but look at the narration of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Um, he narrated the, the Salah of the Prophet and he didn't tell anyone to raise their hands. So, you know, they're debating with each other. And then al says, okay, but look at my hadith. He has a he has a shorter sonnet to the Prophet There's only a few people in between my narration and the Prophet whereas your one's a longer sonnet. So I'm going to prefer my narration. Yeah. Then Imam Hanifa countered him and said, um, yes, but my narrator, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, is more knowledgeable in fiqh than your narrator, Abdullah ibn Umar. So they would always have these back and forth, basically. Yeah. Is making intention fard in wudu? Do we need to make an intention for our wudu to be valid? Anyone? Is there, is there any mention? of intention in the Qur'an, that you must make intention for wudu. Yeah? That's what Han um, the Hanafis, they say intention is not fard. Allah does not mention it. Yeah? But on another, Imam Shafi says intention is fard. If you don't make an intention, at least before you wash your face, or at the time of washing your face, your wudu is invalid. For a Hanafi, if someone pushes you inside a, in, in, a wash, in a swimming pool, and you dipped all the way in, your wudu is done when you come out. Is completely unintentional. You do not have the idea to do wudu, but your wudu is done. For us Hanafis, if you take a bath or a shower, and afterwards you don't have to do wudu again, your wudu is done. Imam Shafi says, no, well, intention is fard. You Hanafis, your wudu will not count. What's his dalil? Anyone know Imam Shafi's dalil? Well, at least one of his dalils, evidences, is the famous hadith of the Prophet Islam, Inna man a'amalu bin niyat. Actions are according to intentions. So now, according to this hadith, if you do not make an intention, then your there is no reward or you know your action is invalid. So let's say salah. If I just stand up, I do everything a person praying salah would do, but I don't make an intention for my, that I'm actually praying. Will my salah be valid? No. Yeah. So likewise, he uses this and he adds another extra fard to wudu and says intention is fard. Yeah, but the, the Han uh, Hanafi say you can't 
you can't add to the Quran or you can't oppose the Quran using a hadith of that sort of nature. Yeah, so these are all Suli differences basically. Um, there's difference in, let's say, the Qunut of Fajr. So I believe it's the Shafi's. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's an established Sunnah. It's an established Sunnah to do the Qunut in. Um, so let's say after you uh, say Samiyallahu and Hamidah after that, you do Qunut. So the Imam is supposed to make dua for the Muslims and so on and so on. Yeah? And the Hanafi say, no, this is not a Sunnah. So where does it come from? So the Hadith that the Prophet is. Um, um, there's one specific hadith that the Prophet like, Sahabi narrates that the Prophet did Qunut in, after the Ruku of Fajr for one month only and never done it before that and never done it after that. So basically the Hanafis use hadith and, said, and they say that the Prophet did it for a specific reason and not that he wanted it to become a sunnah. Yeah, that's one hadith. And another hadith Abu Hurairah narrates and he, he makes it general. He said the Prophet he would generally do Qunut after Ruku. So now, these are two opposing narrations, isn't it? So now, how do you reconcile on what the... So that's why you have different opinions within, you know, in this issue because regarding Hanafis and Shafi'is. So, the point of this is, there are... There's a lot of discussion when it comes to following the Qur'an and Hadith. And it's not so simple. So we were supposed to start this. We'll start this next time, isn't it? Yeah, we've done a bit, Finish quite a bit today. Yeah, we'll finish that actually. It's gone quite lengthy. Yeah, I was supposed to actually finish the prophetic error today. Hadith Mu'ad and Qayyamach of Ijtihad, prophetic error, difference in... Okay, so we're coming to it. So basically, next lesson, we'll go through how fiqh was in the time of the Prophet and why there were so many... why there are contradictory hadith. Yes, today I said, okay, the contradictory hadith, but in the next lesson, we're going to find out why there's contradictory hadith and were there mistakes in the way the Sahaba narrated things or in the way they heard things, um, other reasons for differences. Then we learn about the different types of commands, general, khas, and so on, different. Okay, and then we're gonna go through. Yes, then we're gonna go through thick and air of the companions, and so on, then the tabi'een, and then we'll go into how the schools they formed. And then after that, we'll go through the history of each school. So who were the imams of each school? What were the biographies? Who were their main students? How did the world divide into Hanafis, Shafis, and so on? So then after this course, inshallah, we'll all have a good understanding of the source of Sharia, um, where these different things come from, and how fiqh developed, etc., etc. So now after this, you know, next yeah, time... some give our opinions. <laughs> yeah, inshallah. Okay. Yeah, so I won't go on any further. We'll continue, inshallah, probably, most likely next week, and we'll go through this. And next lesson, I'll ask you guys what you remember from uh, today. Any questions about anything, by the way, that we discussed so far? How many 